So we're going to spend some time talking about some pediatric low vision cases this morning um, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are tuning in from. I titled this, It's Not Rare If It's In Your Chair, because these are relatively rare diagnoses, um, but they do show up and it's important to know uh, what it is that your patient may be uh, needing co-management on, particularly with these systemic syndromes. I've kept the presentation relatively short in terms of slides so that we has, have some time to talk about the cases through the Q&A at the end. So like I said, I'm gonna go through a case discussion of three low vision cases with somewhat less common etiologies. So we'll talk about hermansky pudlak syndrome, Wolfram syndrome, and Alstrom syndrome. And I'll talk to you about how they presented in low vision, what the systemic associations are, and then we'll go back to the low vision case and talk about how we manage them visually. Um, so, you know, in terms of pediatric low vision and blindness to set the stage and make sure we're all talking about the same things, it's about 14 million children worldwide who are blind. And although we don't have really, really updated um, statistics on the types of conditions that can cause vision impairment or blindness, we do know that cerebral vision impairment and optic nerve anomalies like optic nerve hypoplasia are the more common causes, particularly in higher income countries. But recent work um, by Salibo and colleagues in 2017 showed that developing countries are actually shifting to more closely resemble higher income countries in terms of the causes of pediatric low vision and blindness. And this is primarily due to a lot better access to prenatal care and maternal health care, as well as um, better care of the uh, premature babies. And so we are seeing that shift. So worldwide, the causes are starting to kind of line up more with each other rather than the divide between developing countries and higher income countries. We also see retinopathy of prematurity and congenital cataract as common causes of vision impairment in kids. And we're seeing more retinopathy of prematurity again. And um, there had been kind of a pause in that because we were able to kind of titrate oxygen levels better in the neonates. But now technology is allowing medical providers to keep the really young babies alive. And so we are seeing more ROP as we're having those earlier and earlier like preterm infants born who are able to survive. So it's a great medical advance, but it is leading to more ROP again. When we think about the general considerations in pediatric low vision, um, you know, it's not that different than an adult. We're looking at what is that patient's function? How are they doing? Are they able to manage their um, daily activities? But we should also keep in mind what those pediatric daily activities might be. So I really focus on ensuring that my history talks about educational goals and needs. Where are they in school? Um, you know, in terms of what year are they? Are they meeting expectations based on their age? How are their developmental milestones if they're much younger? And are they in a standard classroom receiving services alongside students who don't receive services? Or are they in a special school that is specifically focused on either the vision impairment or if it's a multi-system problem on their general health as well as their vision? And we have also seen that pediatric patients can be more hesitant to integrate low vision devices. There are some social pressures, especially as kids get a little bit older. We see some device abandonment, usually around age eight is where that self-awareness can really kick in. And kids may be less likely to keep using their devices, even if they were using them early. But we do focus on exposure to devices before age eight when possible in the hopes that we can prevent some of the abandonment that happens a little bit later. And then, you know, for my pediatric patients, I also find that there can um, be significant care coordination that takes place when making these recommendations. So we really need to work hard on making sure that we are connecting 
to school related services, as well as in many cases that we'll talk about today to those uh, primary care doctors to perhaps an endocrinologist and ensuring that both the vision and the systemic health are taken care of, as well as the rehabilitation professionals like the mobility instructors, the teachers of the visually impaired, the rehabilitation teachers. So let's just quickly talk about ROP. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because that's not the focus of the lecture, but just a reminder, um, retinopathy of prematurity primarily affects premature infants who are under 1,250 grams and born before 30 weeks of gestation. So these twins met both of those criteria. Um, ROP gets staged by its severity and the mildest forms don't require treatment. In advanced cases, uh, the babies can have tractional retinal detachments. And typically we see treatment with laser, but the more recent literature suggests equal efficacy with anti-VEGF and obviously anti-VEGF doesn't cause retinal scarring. So we are seeing kind of a push towards anti-VEGF injections rather than laser in the NICU babies. And that's what these twins had. In addition to the ROP, as I mentioned, um, neither one had a retinal detachment, which is fantastic. They both were successful with the anti-VEGF. Um, they were also, they also had albinism. So albinism, which I think everyone on here probably already knows, uh, it's an inherited condition with reduced melanin in the skin, hair, and eyes. It is characterized by foveal hypoplasia, as well as high refractive error, nystagmus, and strabismus. There is a really large range in acuities that you can see in people with albinism from mild loss through legal blindness, um, but typically about that 2200 to 2400 is about the worst you see in albinism. So that is a specific type of albinism that includes a platelet dysfunction. So it's characterized by easy bleeding and bruising, and that's often what leads to the diagnosis. So kids that get, you know, a lot of bloody noses or have a lot more bruising than one would expect. In some cases, the uh, patients with hermansky pudlak can also have lung fibrosis, colitis in about 16%, or abnormal storage of seroid lipofusin, so a fatty substance that can lead to liver disease. Um, hermansky pudlak is actually the third most prevalent type of albinism, although it is still fairly rare. And we see it most frequently in patients of Puerto Rican descent. So, um, Particularly in the U.S., we will see Puerto Rican immigrants who are now living uh, on the continental United States, and so we do see this occasionally. In that Puerto Rican population in northwest Puerto Rico, about 1 in 1,800 of um, people in that region have hermansky pudlak syndrome, and 1 in 21 are carriers. So relatively high frequency of people in that specific population are carriers of the gene. So as I mentioned, hermansky pudlak is often first identified because of frequent or easy bruising, as well as bleeding gums or other excessive bleeding that is atypical for what you would expect in young children. And just like all other forms of albinism, the pigmentation can vary. So some people with hermansky pudlak can have relatively normal appearing pigment. They don't look necessarily um, as light skinned as one would expect of someone with albinism. Um, the twins that I was seeing definitely look like they have albinism, but they do have some pigment. Hermansky pudlak is autosomal recessive. As I mentioned, one in 21 are carriers, and it's a mutation in one of these genes that I listed. So our patients had Hermansky pudlak, the HPS3 gene, but there are about 10 total genes that can cause Hermansky pudlak. In terms of treatment and what you're thinking about if these patients are presenting to you, um, as you would expect, because it is a bleeding disorder, you want to avoid aspirin. Um, transfusions may be required if there is significant bleeding that goes on for extended periods of time. And in acute bleeding episodes, there's some research that shows that using desmopressin may be effective. Um, ultimately, 
if your patient ends up developing pulmonary fibrosis, they may ultimately need a lung transplant or other more aggressive treatment of the lung disease. Luckily, in the twins that I was seeing, um, you know, they just monitor them for bleeding and they have not had any lung or other systemic issues. You can also treat with platelet transfusions, um, but the research says these should be used sparingly because of the risk of rejection after multiple transfusions. Uh, because it is a genetic cause of the platelet dysfunction, there is a risk of antibodies developing leading to the rejection. And I'm going to save all of the questions until the end because I think that that will be uh, the most efficient to make sure we get through the cases, but then we will have time for those questions. So we'll go on here to the second case. Um, so this was a seven-year-old referred for low vision evaluation by neuro-ophthalmology. And she was referred because she has significant optic atrophy in the setting of Wolfram syndrome. She was a complicated case because there were some language barriers in addition to the hearing loss. So she came to the first visit accompanied by her sister and her mother. And her sister was assisting with the interpretation as the hospital where she is seen only has interpreters by phone, but her mother is deaf and a Spanish speaker and my Spanish is not fluent. So we needed to use uh, the interpreter over the phone plus her sister kind of helping with interpretation when her mom wasn't able to hear the information. And we did put in a request for follow-up visits to have an in-person interpreter to ensure that there were no additional barriers to providing the information to her parent, her to her mother. In addition to the Wolfram syndrome, she does have a systemic history of alopecia, hearing loss, which goes along with Wolfram, as well as sleep apnea. She's not currently on any medications, and it sounded like the diagnosis was relatively recent. So let's talk a little bit about Wolfram syndrome. So it is a syndrome characterized by diabetes insipidus, diabetes mellitus, optic atrophy, and deafness. And although I think most people probably remember the difference, just in case, um, diabetes insipidus is a type of polyuria or frequent urination with normal blood sugars. It's not related to insulin or blood sugar. What's happening is that the body isn't creating the appropriate concentration of urine. So it's a kidney-mediated disease, typically caused by issues with vasopressin production. Diabetes mellitus, we all know, I think, can also have polyuria, but it's related to the blood glucose. And in Wolfram syndrome, they can get both of the, these. So they can have the kidney disease related to issues with vasopressin production, as well as the pancreatic disease related to insulin concerns. Um, Wolfram is an inherited condition, and it's related to a mutation typically in the WFS1 gene and less commonly in the WFS2. It's typically autosomal recessive. Wolfram syndrome is relatively rare, and because of that, the presentation and onset of symptoms can be highly variable but typically we see the development of diabetes mellitus as well as optic atrophy by the age of 16. And less than half also develop diabetes insipidus, but it's something to be watching for, especially when the symptoms could be similar to what's in diabetes mellitus. So the kidney function is monitored closely in patients with Wolfram. Um, interestingly to me, I was surprised that a seven-year-old had the diagnosis of sleep apnea but as I learned more about Wolfram syndrome, um, I had seen that it was often associated with sleep apnea. Some patients with Wolfram syndrome also have urinary tract abnormalities separate from the hormone-mediated kidney disease. And so close monitoring with um, the genitourinary specialists, like renal specialist, nephrologist, you've got to kind of watch all the different pieces and make sure that, you know, one symptom isn't being blamed on one particular problem when it is common for both genitourinary tract issues to happen as well as kidney disease. 
And often patients with Wolfram syndrome have ataxia and poor balance. And that is something that was happening in my patient that we'll talk about more, but kind of understanding, you know, what, what parts of her mobility issues are related to the Wolfram and what parts of her mobility issues are related to her vision. And finally, and this part was very interesting as well, is there's a much higher incidence of depression and anxiety in patients with Wolfram syndrome. And I think we could easily explain that as, you know, kids getting diagnosed with a pretty significant systemic syndrome, but they actually think that it is related to changes in the nervous system, which cause the optic atrophy, as well as the ataxia and the hearing loss, that those changes also lead to the depression and anxiety rather than just quality of life types of concerns, though both are probably factors in these cases. So for Wolfram syndrome, um, you know, you need to treat the coexisting conditions. So insulin for diabetes, vasopressin, sorry that is, there's a typo there, but vasopressin for diabetes insipidus, and then really making sure you've got the right people co-managing. Uh, you know, you hope that whoever made the diagnosis checks these different boxes, but I find that the low vision assessment can be a time to really look at the full systemic picture and ask, you know, who else are they seeing? Who is involved in the care? And if you don't have a good electronic medical record system where you can share all of the notes, make sure that the patient and their family has access to the notes to share among the different groups. So they recommend, you know, referral for neurology, a neurology consult, as well as hearing consults and a sleep assessment if they haven't already received that diagnosis of sleep apnea, because it is very common in Wolfram. So let's go back to our case. So, you know, this seven-year-old came in and we wanted to get into her functional history and she's having a hard time kind of with a lot of different aspects of her vision. So she has a hard time seeing small print and she sits at the front of the classroom to see the board more easily. She has a hard time seeing to take notes. So it's hard for her to see her handwriting. And for her daily living activities, her mom felt like she did less than similar kids in age. So she relies on her family for things like kind of cleaning up her room and helping with basic chores around the house, like setting the table. And her mom wasn't sure if the vision was why she wasn't doing it or if there was something more going on. In terms of her mobility, she has had multiple falls and she frequently bumps into things. So that's where, you know, that question is, is there some ataxia or some sort of neurological balance concern going on? Or is this all related to her vision? And I suspect that it's probably a degree of both. She does have an individualized education program in place for school. Um, and she reports that she doesn't like school. In terms of her ocular findings, um, she really shows significant fluctuations visit to visit. So I've seen her a number of times now after that first visit where we were just getting to know her. And she ranges from kind of as bad as three feet over 300 and three feet over 400 on a fine bloom chart, isolated numbers, to as good as about 2100 on a Snellen chart. Um, and it's day to day. So it's not that she has progressed from 2100 to worse vision. It just depends on the day and how she's accessing her vision. In addition, her contrast sensitivity fluctuates quite a bit visit to visit. So she ranges anywhere from 0.72 log units as her worst measurement. So uh, pretty severe for her age and severe even for an older adult. And her best measurement is 1.2 log units. So that's Moderate loss if we were talking about an adult, but still relatively severe loss for someone her age. We've refracted her numerous times and she really has no improvement with lenses, although she does often tell us that, you know, plus a quarter makes things significantly clearer. Uh, but I think that there are, is a psychological factor in sort of hoping that glasses will make it easier for her because she is really struggling with her vision impairment. Her confrontation visual fields have showed constriction 360 degrees in each eye. And so far we haven't been able to get a reliable Goldman field with her. 
Um, so, you know, in terms of our reading assessment, she is not yet a fluent reader and she's below grade level for all of her reading tasks. She did read um, spotting letters on our lighthouse near spotting card, um, some spotting letters and some shapes. And she read to about 10 M. So really, really big print was all that she was willing to do in our exam. That gives her an FEQ or estimated starting power for near of 40 diopters. Um, this was pretty atypical of what I would expect in a young child. Uh, typically, they hold things pretty close. They rely on their accommodation and they're able to do a bit better at near. She wouldn't hold things any closer than 25 centimeters and wouldn't read smaller than the 10 M print. But I think that generally she's struggling so much kind of understanding her vision that we ran into a little bit of an issue there with, you know, just kind of pushing her to get to smaller print because it's hard for her to access her vision and utilize it effectively. We looked at magnification for reading, you know, based on that 40 diopter FEQ, we started a bit lower power. We started even with some dome magnifiers, but she really didn't have a very good response to magnification for reading. Um, for whatever reason, she felt like it was just making things worse. She did have improved spot reading when we looked at a telescope for distance. And we started with a 2.5X. I typically start with that lower powered telescope, like a 2.5, just to get a sense of how a pediatric patient responds. So some kids do great and they immediately take to the telescope. They can focus, they can localize. And then we can go up in power to something that we think would be a bit more appropriate. Um, in her case, she had immediate improvement and she got to 20 over 70 vision. But when we went to higher power, she stopped gaining uh, acuity. So it was unclear whether she was having trouble with the small field of view because of her constricted fields or a contrast issue, but she didn't get better at higher powers. And we tried some digital magnification. So using a portable CCTV, again, just to see if we could get better visual engagement. And um, sometimes she seemed engaged and seemed to like using it. And sometimes she didn't. It was hard to get a, a good read on what was making her more comfortable visually. So, you know, in terms of her plan of care, uh, she has a, a complex condition, and I suspect that the neurological factors are really playing a big role in why her responses are so variable. But I encouraged exploring the devices again in her classroom and at home because of what we were seeing in the exam room, that it was sometimes working and sometimes not. But the exam room is not necessarily the best place to assess low vision devices in pediatric patients. And, you know, I, I was concerned with multiple disabilities, including the hearing loss, that she had not had a formal learning media assessment yet to determine her best learning modality. She reports a lot of difficulty at school and just doesn't like school in general. So um, we talked to her teacher of the visually impaired and they did have plans to do a learning media assessment for her to figure out if she should be using other tools to help her with her learning. We, we always you know, encourage the ongoing work with her teacher of the visually impaired, and she was doing that. And based on her reduced acuity at near in the exam room and her kind of unwillingness to hold things closer and use her accommodation, we recommended that they start by enlarging the font on all of her materials to begin with. Over time, she may be able to access materials in smaller print, and utilize devices. And you know, we don't want her to rely on someone enlarging things long-term because for life, that's not gonna be a really sustainable solution. But in, for her immediate needs where she isn't able to access her school materials, we did recommend two to three times her threshold to allow her to begin to learn to read more effectively um, if that's going to be a possible solution for her, but at least to make sure the print is big enough when she's trying to learn to read. We recommended bold pens based on the reduced contrast sensitivity, as well as reducing the crowding of the materials that she's presented with. So many times, you know, elementary school worksheets have lots of, lots of information on them, lots of subdivided groups. And so we recommended that they reduce crowding and present her with less complex materials at a time 
so that she can better visually engage with what she's receiving. So in terms of Alstrom syndrome, um, symptoms generally present in infancy, but it can be variable. And just as we talked about with the other two syndromes, it has pretty significant systemic conditions. Um, Alstrom is usually associated with both vision and hearing loss, and it is autosomal recessive. It is associated with mutations in the ALMS1 gene, which is where his mutation was. The vision problems in Alstrom syndrome typically start with a cone rod dystrophy that eventually leads to legal blindness. And most children with Alstrom syndrome have nystagmus. Um, when he presented to me, I thought that he sounded a lot more like he had a cone dystrophy just based on you know, the profound sensitivity to bright lights as compared to retinitis pigmentosa where you would typically early on expect decent tolerance of bright light and worse function in the dark. Um, so that, that matched what we ended up getting with the diagnosis. I wasn't expecting Alstrom syndrome to come back as the diagnosis. I was expecting some type of cone dystrophy. Um, systemically, he is now managed by an entire team at one of our large hospitals here because it is associated with progressive hearing loss, with cardiomyopathy, with childhood obesity, with insulin resistance and type two diabetes, hyperlipidemia, fatty liver, short stature, acanthosis nigricans on the skin, as well as hypogonadism. Um, in his case, he does not have short stature. He is extremely tall, uh, but he had been struggling with childhood, childhood obesity and the mom was, was working with the pediatrician to try to figure out, you know, he was eating just like his siblings and was just gaining a lot more weight. And they were, they were really having trouble understanding what was going on there. So she was really grateful for this diagnosis because it helped her understand that it wasn't anything she was doing and it wasn't anything he was doing. He was predisposed to childhood obesity. And he's now being watched very carefully to ensure that he doesn't um, need treatment for the cardiomyopathy, and that he doesn't develop type two diabetes. But so far all has been clear from cardiology and endocrinology, and they're just watching closely. Um, with Alstrom syndrome, as you would expect, you know, there's no specific treatment for the syndrome itself. You treat each condition as it develops, and it's that careful management with a team of specialists um, and, you know, pediatric geneticists potentially to kind of look at each systemic condition and treat what needs to be treated. So the medications can include insulin or ACE inhibitors or hormone therapy um, if short stature is a major problem. And referrals for vision services like low vision, as well as audiology are recommended to make sure those services are integrated early. So in conclusion, you know, these are three unique pediatric cases that are caused by kind of rare systemic syndromes, but each pediatric case still has the same common themes of looking at the educational goals, assessing the vision, and figuring out what low vision aids may be helpful. Uh, but we have a unique role where, in addition to assessing the vision, we can be the people who can look at the comprehensive care the patient is receiving and just make sure that you know, their pediatrician is aware of that systemic condition or that perhaps that their ophthalmologist is aware of who else they're seeing and just make sure that the care coordination is happening and that the school system understands that there is more than just vision going on because that makes it a little bit more complicated when you're working with these kids in the classroom. And our plan of care just should take into account the complex needs of these patients. So sometimes they're overwhelmed by all of the medical appointments they're going to. And that may make the, the patient even more hesitant to integrate the low vision devices while they're undergoing all these other major medical treatments. So allow your patients to communicate to you and tell you what's going on and you know, what, what tools seem helpful and what doesn't seem helpful. And even you know, at age three, four or five, or even younger, um, kids can let you know what's working and what's not working. And so, Listen to the kids, listen to the parents, and make sure that you're looking at that complete picture as you make your updated recommendations. 
Um, there's a question here that says, is it possible for a four or five-year-old child that they're having problems kind of holding the dome magnifier or the telescope? Uh, you know, for the most part, I've actually seen that even two and three-year-olds can handle the dome magnifier pretty well. Um, some, some kids, not so much, but usually I like to kind of see what happens when I hand them the device to figure out if, if they're able to handle it well. Uh, so some kids do great and some don't, you know, some put the telescope right up to their eye without any additional education and some kind of put it at their nose or the middle of their forehead or they have a lot of trouble using it. So I like to just gauge with a particular patient, just watch to see what they do. And sometimes it's they're too young and we need to wait a bit and we will look at it later. Uh, but yeah, some do great, some don't. It's really variable. It's kind of true with our older adults as well. Some do great handling devices and some don't. Great, just some of these are just comments. Um, so this is a question about, do you recommend sibling examination in the case of a child with low vision? Um, I do, I mean, I recommend comprehensive exam for kids regardless. And, um, you know, I don't, I would refer to the geneticist to figure out if that sibling should also have genetic testing. My guess is that that's already been discussed with the family, but I do usually ask that question. I have a whole family of kids with dominant optic atrophy who I follow and three of the four siblings have it. And we've worked with the geneticist to kind of figure out whether it makes sense to test that fourth sibling. And so far they've said no, because there's no treatment and he doesn't have any symptoms, but we do a comprehensive exam with them anyway to make sure that they're doing well. Um, and so, you know, I think it is important to talk to the parents about, you know, whether the siblings may have issues. And, you know, in a case of something like Alstrom syndrome, they may recommend, you know, really early examination of any siblings. They may even do genetic testing uh, before pregnancy to figure out, you know, who is there, you know, additional risk? Was it a new mutation? But in their case, they weren't planning on having more children. And they said they're they're pretty certain that both parents were carriers and that it was the autosomal recessive mutation. Yeah. But definitely worth talking about if there are siblings in case they are also carriers of the condition. Um, in Wolfram syndrome, carriers can have mild symptoms. So we think that's what's going on with the, the mom who is deaf of the patient I see. Mom's never had genetic testing, but we assume she's a carrier because she does have hearing loss. So the case three did go through um, initial electrophysiologic testing and it was sort of inconsistent. Um, it didn't really match the presentation of retinitis pigmentosa. So I had been surprised that's what he got diagnosed with. It looked more like a cone dystrophy to me when I read the ERG. Um, they have not repeated his ERG at this point because they know they know that it is a cone rod dystrophy because that is what happens in Alstrom syndrome and it matches all of his clinical findings. So they haven't, they haven't retested him in terms of electrophysiology, uh, mostly because they're going to perhaps do it when he's older. So he won't need, you know, an exam under anesthesia at that point, but right now it would just be academic. They don't really need that additional information. Uh, there is a question about visual acuity measurements if were they all single optotype. So actually they were not, um, some of them when I did the fine bloom, that's mostly single optotype, but the others were um, typically reading on an ETDRS chart actually. So multiple optotypes with some crowding, which probably showed worse acuity than they might be able to achieve if we did single optotype without crowding. But when the kids are able to do it, I don't necessarily isolate the lines unless I need to, to add information to what the teachers are doing in school. There is a question about um, labor's congenital amaurosis. So there's nystagmus and glare, um, and how would you treat it? So similar to the case with Alstrom syndrome, I actually, I kind of thought he was going to come back as having labors based on the high refractive error, the nystagmus, and the glare sensitivity. Um, or just a general cone dystrophy, but you would you would actually 
treat the symptoms. And so, you know, perhaps you would use prism to help get into a null point with the nystagmus. You would use tinted lenses, you would um, correct the refractive error, and then whatever low vision devices helped improve the visual function as well. So pretty similar management in that case. Uh, there's a question about the VA after refraction for case three. So I gave you best corrected visual acuity in case three. So that 2320 that he was achieving was his best corrected visual acuity. There is a question about whether so I'm using the 2.5X monocular telescope in my assessment um, and whether I would use binocular and if there's any difference. Um, I typically use monocular only because it's, it's small and easy so that the child can hold it pretty well. I like to see which eye is dominant, um, see you know, which hand, which eye do they go to automatically. But I don't think there's anything wrong with doing it with a binocular telescope as well. Um, because they are functioning binocularly. So that may be a, a quick, easy way to assess it as well. I'm just trying to gauge their response to distance magnification. So I think that that would be appropriate as well, unless, unless you have dramatically different acuities between the eyes, and then they're really only using one with it anyway. Um, I know there are some concerns. There's a comment about the, the cost of low vision devices. Um, that is a, a very true statement. Um, the reality with a lot of the tools is that they are expensive. It's also why we kind of look at some of the, the domes and the low cost telescopes. Um, those are pretty easy to integrate and they're not super expensive the way that like a video magnifier might be. And so we, we do try to go to kind of the, the simpler lower cost devices to start with and then if needed, you know, we can even get a low cost tablet in some situations if we have to, but presenting materials in high contrast, you know, printing out the pages in black and white can help circumvent the need for some of those digital devices as well. So question on visual field testing in pediatric patients. Uh, you can get them in really, really young patients. There are some, there's some research being done on on using kind of modified techniques in infants. Uh, my colleague is able to get Goldman visual fields even in you know, two-year-old patients where I have access to a Goldman, it's a little bit harder. We, we don't typically do it till they're maybe five or six, but a really mature three or four-year-old could probably do it. Uh, and you know, maybe a, a less mature six or seven-year-old might not be able to. So you wanna kind of gauge your patient to see if they're able to. All right, I think that is all the time that I have for questions, but thank you all for being here today. And uh, we'll see you again at another webinar soon.